And for me, what has happened to the Conservative Party in the last few years is that it has ceased to be the Conservative Party which we've had all, all my lifetime and actually going back probably 150, 200 years to its foundation, the party of, of Burke and Oakeshott. And it's become uh, the party of the alt-right. I am exceptionally honoured to have the esteemed journalist and author Peter O'Born with me. Peter, hello. Good, good, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, however people are listening. And we are here... We're, in large part, we're discussing your book, The Assault on Truth, which really should be mandatory reading about our current administration. First of all, I just want to be maybe a bit provocative. Let's throw this one in. Now, some would say maybe on the right would go, well, hold on, Peter Oborn. Constantly firing away at these, at the, at, 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 at the at conservative politicians on the right. You're not really a conservative anymore. What would you say to that? Well, maybe I have drifted off to the left but on the other hand maybe the right has drifted away from me and that's what the way I see it so you see I see uh, a conservatism in a way in which you on the left certainly don't do but I see it as about defense of, of the union defense of due process defense of institutions of the state a particular sort of way of seeing the world um, a, a humanity about it too and for me what has happened to the Conservative Party in the last few years is that it has ceased to be the Conservative Party which we've had all, all my lifetime and actually going back probably 150, 200 years to its foundation, the party of, of Burke and Oakeshott. And it's become uh, the party of the alt-right. It's become a, a, a far-right sect. It's, it's certainly moving very fast in that direction. So. You might. Uh, so that, that is what I would argue, that I have stayed roughly in the same place. Where, and it's the party itself which has moved away. We'll talk about Boris Johnson. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about his own, well, <laughs> I think Boris Johnson and philosophy is pushing it. But what, let's just paint a little portrait of Boris Johnson and your, your own relationship with him. Because what's so fascinating about when you write about Boris Johnson is you're not simply writing as a detached observer who based on having seen him from afar has made a judgment he's someone you know very well and in fact he employed you didn't he he was a wonderful employer as well tell me about him well the uh, i'll tell you first of all about the boris who edited the uh, spectator 20 years who hired me as political correspondent of the spectator about uh, 20 years ago um i think uh I, 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 people said he didn't stand for anything at all. What they meant was, and it was unfair, that, 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 he, that, that the paper was very eclectic. It embraced all sorts of different ideas. It was, it was, uh, it was very liberal in the um, old-fashioned sense of the word. It was, it, 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 it's, it's allowed anybody to write from almost any any direction. Um, yet it had was where I disagreed with them. It had a an idea of conservatism. In other words, we spent a lot of our time defending uh, conservative institutions, defending Parliament against the uh, attacks from the then the Blairite left or the Blairite government, defend, defending the civil service and its integrity. Um, and we and we also spent a lot of time defending the truth. And Boris used to do that too. You know, I I remember him. Uh, you know, us attacking. The Labour government over weapons of mass destruction. We had ma major collisions of the the Blair government over that, and so that was the Barrett Boris Johnson. Then he was he was an extraordinarily intelligent man. He he had to you never really had to ex you never had to explain anything to him twice. He uh, he had an extraordinary uh, he was very charismatic as we all know, and so now I'm trying to reconcile that Johnson how I knew and really revered about 20 years ago with the character who now runs the country and who is running a, 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 a an alt-right, I think. Is, it's difficult. We haven't quite pinned it down yet. Um, uh, Mark, I think he's Mark, Jeremy Cliff, is he the new statesman? That's right. 
Yeah, he, he wrote a very interesting piece about a year ago to, comparing Johnson to Orban in Hungary. And I think that's right. There is a sort of state uh, state clientelism, uh, along with all right sort of messages all the time about race and uh, and Islamophobia and and quite an ugly move towards the towards. I don't think it's right to call it fascist, but very authoritarian right. Um, that's extraordinary appointment uh, two days ago uh, of William Shawcross as the reviewer of Prevent, a man who's well known for anti-Islamic opinions and connected with um, right-wing think tanks, which have constructed a, a sort of state security view of Islam. He's, I guess, the latest, or the other one with the BBC chairman who, um, who, who, who supports Quilliam Foundation and, and its... It's very troublesome research about so-called uh, fake research about a very inflammatory fake research about grooming gangs. I mean, th th this is a very this is quite a nasty government, a frightening government. Mm. And trying to re re reconcile Doris Johnson then and now is an impossible thing to do. William Shawcross, whose his daughter was my tutorial partner and then ended up as George Osborne's uh, political advisor. Bizarre world we live in. Just on Hungary, I don't want to lose Hungary because I think it's a really important point. I went to Hungary in 2016 and spent a few days there interviewing dissidents, human rights campaigners, uh, non-government organisations who face repression. And I found in my darker moments, I worry that Hungary is the trajectory in which Britain is heading. Not Poland is another striking example as well. But, you know, Fidesz, which is the ruling party in Hungary, began, it was seen as a centrist liberal party. It was part of the Liberal International. And Orban was seen as a post-communist liberal reformer venerated in the West. And it radicalised. It was a centre-right party that radicalised in power and embraced a combination of xenophobia and... Um, uh, you know, ex well, extreme racism in lots of ways, but also wanton authoritarianism. I mean, do you think that is where we're headed? It's very, I, I was taking notes as you spoke there because I hadn't known that. One of the really interesting and completely unexplored, uh, it's one of the many articles I have, <laughs> I would write if um, I had the time, is, is what happened to the Tory modernizers um, who the uh, press sort of. Um, sort of fell in love with in the uh, at the at the turn of the century, uh, and what happened to them? Now you you look. I mean, you have Steve Hilton, who was the sort of uh, far out um, advisor to David Cameron. Now a sort of, <laughs> I mean, now an apologist for for Trump and the worst the worst of Trump. Um, Michael Gove's another very interesting case in point. Who was hailed as a great modernizer. Um, taking on the establishment uh, 15 years ago and has now become quite a sinister figure, if you ask me, at the heart of this um, government. And there are a lot of other cases. The trajectory of the Tory modernizers from being very liberal to being very right wing it is, I, I, we, there's a beautiful essay in it at some point by somebody. Yeah, I mean, I've interviewed Baroness Saeed Avasi, the most prominent female Muslim politician. She particularly pointed out Michael Gove as being very pernicious in terms of his stance on Islam, Islamophobia and so on. Uh, just in terms of, before I talk about, I mean, because you, you talk about, you know, contrasting Boris Johnson to his predecessors and, and why he represents a very disturbing step change. But I do think it's interesting. I mean... Back in 1947, Hugh Dalton was Chancellor of the Exchequer under Clement Attlee, and he actually resigned in 1947 after he inadvertently revealed the sentence of his budget to a reporter minutes before he delivered the budget, which I have to say is probably the most minor, absurd dis misdemeanor I could think of in political life. And yet, what does that tell us now, I suppose, in terms of, you know, a, 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 ch a chance of the Exchequer resigned over the most tiny foible imaginable and the threshold for resignation is 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 is, is uh, significantly higher? Let me give you another example. And I, I, I'm beginning to think that more and more of her as a, as a heroine, as a hero, um, Estelle Morris, who was a very decent uh, education secretary under the Blair government, uh, she made a promise, do you remember, about exam, something to do with exam results. Mm -hmm. And when that promise wasn't met, she resigned. And uh, I think that's an absolutely 
awesome. Uh, it's like Lord Carrington rightly gets remembered for resigning about the Falklands War, but uh, when it, when when the Argentinians invaded, but Estelle Morris, the sheer honour of what Estelle Morris did, um, uh, and of course Williamson as Education Secretary, um, you know, does far worse things, uh, and it's never a question of resignation. And so, yes, there has been a convulsive change in the morality of political life, yes. Before we talk about some of the just extraordinary lies of the Boris Johnson um, era, I suppose, you know, what I would put to you is, and you do look at this, and, and you, as you pointed out, you've spent a lot of time exposing the deceit, the dishonesty, the travesties of the new Labour era under Tony Blair. But, you know, some would say, well, you know, however bad Boris Johnson is, he hasn't uh, gone to war on a false pretext with the consequent deaths of hundreds of thousands of innocent people. Though I'd note we have the worst coronavirus, one of the worst coronavirus death tolls on earth. Uh, but also take Theresa May. I mean, this is the point you make about the predecessors, his predecessors, that actually whatever their flaws, they did have some sense of decency, integrity, commi honourable commitment to standards in public Gordon life. Brown, yeah. Yeah. Gordon Brown, but take Theresa May, for example. Theresa May, I mean, she once famously claimed an illegal immigrant avoided deportation because of his cat, because he had a cat. It just, I mean, it wasn't true. So, I mean, I wonder how much, you know, because Theresa May now, like a lot of people, when they leave public office, I, I worry sometimes people are rose-tinted about that mm. particular era. I mean, what do you look? do you look back and think, you know, how much of a big demarcation is there between Boris Johnson and, and, and those more recent predecessors? Now, I agree with you that, you know, that that, that that particular episode, which was when she was Home Secretary, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. And um, and David Cameron did this. You can point to similar things there and, and Gordon Brown. But what they didn't do was systematically and structurally lie uh, from inside Downing Street. Uh, and there's no question that something uh, perverted happened as if you love Britain and you feel proud to be British, and you respect the office of prime minister, and you believe that integrity in public life somehow matters, when um, the, the, literally the day that, that, that Johnson entered Dining Street, because I, as, you, as you say, I wrote a book about political lying in the, mm -hmm. actually I wrote it when Boris Johnson was editor of The Spectator and I was working for him. And, um, and we and I set out the the methodology of deceit from from New Labour, and I think you're completely right that no single lie from Johnson, uh, you know, the weapons of mass destruction, but which, by the way, Blair insists was not a lie. You know, let's let's acknowledge. Yeah. Um, but had, was a, remotely that consequence. But what you have is a what you didn't and didn't happen under Blair was that there is now a systematic use of the Downing Street machine to smear and uh, and lie and cheat. And it happened the moment that Johnson entered Downing Street. And I chronicle these lies. And the reason I know what I'm saying is the case is that I've always kept a loose file of whenever I see there's been a lie from Downing Street, I shove it in the file. And it was it was very the file was always growing under Blair. It then um you know, he, Gordon Brown was a lot, lot better as as was Cameron and uh, and May. There was there were obviously cases in point, but then suddenly it just went out, went, went through the roof. And you might even remember I kept a, I, it was so bad that I kept a record of uh, open the website Boris Johnson Lies dot com. You can still access it, mm -hmm. recording each and well not each because there were too many, but as many as I could of the Johnson Lies. Or, and from his ministers, and, and something happened, and it was associated with his arrival, utterly amoral, and he brought in the most terrible people, Dominic Cummings and others, who, who obviously sanctioned this. They operated behind the scenes, and also they co-opted an awful lot of the British media. In this point, I mean, you go, Pat, you go, go over the pre-Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his his record of dishonesty. I mean, this was, of course, a man sacked twice for dishonesty, once by his newspaper editor and once by the leader of the Conservatives, Michael Howard, uh, when he was a shadow minister. Look, I'm not going to pretend that I have uh, the, 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 the closest of links to the Parliamentary Conservative Party, but it is true that back in 2018, I remember speaking to a Tory MP in kind of green room somewhere on the media world, 
And he assured me Boris Johnson would never get in the final two. That Conservative MPs regarded him with contempt, had no respect for him. I mean, isn't it the case that in 2019, Tory MPs, by and large, including many of the people he supported and nominated him, they, they knew he was a liar and a charlatan, duplicitous, didn't really believe in anything other than himself, not a man of honour, not a man of, of, of honesty or integrity. But they backed him because they thought he was the unique antithesis to the populist kind of heads of Corbynism and Farageism. But they knew what they 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 knew what he was, but but they they embraced him because they believed he had a specific function. I th- yeah, well, I'm always a bit careful about attributing motive to to anybody. It's a good rule not to. And so, if you ask any, uh, of course, you had that conversation to go back on, and I have had similar conversations with with Tory MPs, but I've also had. And it's quite haunts me this quite a number of conversations with senior Tories who deny that he's a liar. <laughs> and no, no, I mean, it's quite kind of uncanny, actually. They are quite convinced that he's not. Um, uh, my, uh, but your, your point is that some of them must have just, just made a naked calculation that he will win us an election and um, that we need this man despite the fact he's completely amoral and um, and lies. And I've had, you know, I, I have also had conversations of the sort you mentioned, though I would say they're outnumbered by people who seem to think that he is not a liar. So you detail for a very in-depth, uh, painful, I have to say, looking back, um, chapter on the 2019 general election, which of course culminated in a 80-seat Conservative majority. Just the, the litany of lies, 40 new hospitals, Labour will spend £1.2 trillion before they'd even release their manifesto. Corbyn wants to abolish the armed forces. Uh, kind of little pathetic lies. He'd given up drink the day after he'd been filmed sipping whiskey. Corbyn compared to Joseph Stalin, who was, of course, responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people. What does it say about our media ecosystem that it was just possible to lie in that way, but I, I would, you know, those lies were treated not as lies by the media. I mean, when Trump was president, lots of media outlets made, you know, they went out of their way. They had a specific commitment to pointing out when Donald Trump was lying. They would say CNN or whatever, and it would drive Donald Trump, you know, up the, around the U-Ben. But he, they would say this is a lie by the president. They would clearly make that. That's not what the media. How the, they would maybe say it was contested, or Labour denies. But they didn't treat it as a lie. No, I, I um, tried to raise this issue, as you probably remember, during the uh, general election. And I recorded these lies as it was going on, actually. I put them up on my website. And uh, and actually, The Guardian very kindly um, ran one of these articles. And uh, But it was very hard to get it in the newspapers, um, any idea that Johnson was lying. There was a deliberately deliberate cult of blindness or a martyr in the mass the majority of the media by which i don't just include newspapers i include the major broadcasters in uh, paying not paying attention to johnson's to see and very often collaborating with it i.e sort of taking f- false statements from dining street aids and, and putting it out there I think one of the, the lowest points of that election, I mean, there were many low points, many nadirs, but one was, it, it was widely reported by senior broadcasters and media outlets that a Labour activist had punched a Tory aide in the, fa- in the face, which was just repeated as fact. And then it was only that, in, only in the social media age where people have cameras on their phones, was that revealed later, not not to yeah. be the case at all. You can see, absurd to suggest it. In that election campaign, two Labour activists, both in their 70s, one a woman, were physically assaulted by a uh, politically motivated attack, one with cracked ribs, beaten up. You know, one a woman in her 70s. No media reporting. And yet, something which was just a lie fed by Conservative spin doctors, which broadcasters clearly didn't do due diligence on just regurgitated it as a fact what does that yeah. tell us well i 
it shows an ink well the first thing it tells you um Anne, is a phenomenal lack of professionalism i mean the first thing you should do as a journalist is to check your facts independently and not put something out until you are certain or as, as certain as you can be i accept that you're operating obviously within very very narrow time frames that it's true uh, and that they didn't show that professionalism they didn't show that care to establish the truth there were quite a number of these sort of incidents during the election campaign and i have to say that time after time they would there are this inaccurate reporting and there are lots of examples of what you're just saying saying that it all i think it always favored johnson over corbyn i think there was basically corbyn was condemned out of hand as guilty uh, and Johnson could get away with what he liked. I mean, the you may and for another example is uh, the, the the live broadcast on Sky. I think it was of a Johnson sort of uh, election speech uh, where he made a whole load of fake comment, false comments about Corbyn, the forty hospitals you mentioned, and uh, he was and numerous others, uh, and they were and the Sky. There was a political reporter at the scene. Uh, and the political reporter just sat there, monitored what was going on, and then just passed you back to the studio. So it made no attempt to point out that there were four or five very serious lies uh, uttered by Johnson on the campaign trail in that 10-minute stump speech. It was just screened live without any... And this happened again and again. I, I can make you... we, we and a lot of broadcasters, senior broadcasters, very senior broadcasters, were guilty of this negligence, lack of professionalism. At that point, you pointed out, in fact, during the campaign, that the errors made by the BBC just always happened to favour Boris Johnson. There was never oh, an error in favour of Johnson. The BBC has got a problem. It, it's cowed. It's cowed. Uh, and I think it has to have come from the top. Wow. You can't just blame the journalists are the senior you must blame the senior management at the bbc who are responsible for obviously that they obviously frightened of what the government is threatening to do and that it clearly is the appointment of um is he richard sharp i think he's called the uh, former banker who who, who um, is such an admirer of the quilliam foundation i mean he, he, he that he's there for a reason and uh, and i i wish the bbc would um stand up for the Rethian values which it's inherited and rather than try and sort of pathetically do what the Johnson government report events in the way the government wants it to be reported. What's so perversely successful about lying all the time, and it's perverse but it is successful, it's perversely, it's perverse, it's successful, it's perversely successful, is if you are a politician who gets away with lying all the time, then what we we no longer have a means of adjudicate you know we 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 lose any sense of what is truth and what is not truth so you you can you can distort people's sense of reality you can gaslight the nation as much as you want but you a floodgate is opened you know you by by being able to get away with lying over and over and over again yeah. where you have a media ecosystem which does not for whatever reason call out those lies as lies then truth is abolished in politics. And then where does that lead? Well, it, it takes us into sort of terrible areas where, first of all, it's very difficult to explain anything because you're always inventing something uh, new or creating a fake fact in order to justify your current predicament. It must make, and it makes, must make decision-making very difficult because instead of being honest, you're always creating making some making something up which isn't true to justify a decision and then you have to live with that or maybe you move on um it does bring i, I just don't think it's possible to sustain it a democratic state forever because there is it is of course deeply uh demo, undemocratic but it's attack on democracy because you're stealing the ability of the voter to distinguish between what you know what is right and what is wrong what is true and false and they're going to be voting uh, on on false information, which has been uh, and the I'm going back to the broadcasters. It's their job to keep these things uh, to keep these things honest. It's their job to expose dishonesty and untruth. 
that's what we are. That's, there's not, it's not a very grand thing, actually, being a journalist. It's a bit like being a, a job, by the way, which we're very thankful for and is very honourable, you know, working in a sewage plant or something like that. <laughs> Your job is just to sort of keep the rest of life sanitary. And I think that a lot of journalists sort of pride themselves on their access to these powerful household names when they really there are and actually that's meaningless your job's to tell the truth and and you really it's better if you keep away from these household names because your job is to tell them what's happening uh, you know to hold them to account without fear or favor because one of the things which the johnson government does and all governments have done by the way is to use access information um and sources uh, to uh, you know as a reward and they deny access to people who ask difficult questions um, and Beth Rigby was an in case in point she uh, very good editor of Sky News who's a political editor who asked very difficult questions I think at Johnson's first mm -hmm. press conference and was never given an interview I think I'm actually saying with Johnson after that and so then her bosses say, why aren't you getting an interview with Boris Johnson? What's why? And so, you're, you, you know, your job is on the line because suddenly you've got, you can't deliver the interview. You've got, you haven't got that breathless exclusive, which your competition have got. Uh, and so it's very hard for a political editor or a political journalist to report truth in a way which is not framed by Dining Street. And I'm afraid that not enough of them do that. In October 2019, you wrote a piece for Open Democracy entitled British Journalists Have Become Part of Johnson's Fake News Machine, in which you explored that in, in detail. It's, a, it's an article people really should read. You said since then, the mainstream British press and media is to all intents and purposes barred to me. So just want to explain, what does that tell us? What kind of you, is an emerter, let's say, which exists within the British media that journalists do not criticise other journalists? Uh, and, and what does that tell us? Because the media is a should be a pillar of democracy, and therefore, if it's failing to do its job, it does need to be scrutinised. But that scene within the media industry is the one thing you do not do. Uh, you know, the media can pick on benefit claimants, Muslims, refugees, migrants, people who don't have a voice. But when journalists are criticised, all hell must break loose. But just tell me, tell me about what the article was aiming to do, what it what it explored, but also that response and what it says. Well, in that article, I, I, I tried to explain, uh, and I gave a lot of vivid examples, and I named names of how journalists were telling untruths, which strongly favoured the, uh, the, the Johnson government and attacked and were damaging to its opponents. And they were relying on unnamed so-called Dining Street sources um you know to for instance a particularly squalid and horrible example where dining street briefed out uh, and so the journalists were able to say dining street sources say that three very so oliver letwin dominic grieve and i think and hillary ben three very honorable politicians uh were, were somehow working were taking were working for a foreign power because they were causing trouble over the government's Brexit plans. Now, and that was put out as splashes, as a splash. So it went out on the Mail on Sunday, I think the Times, the Sun, uh, the, I, 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 and I checked into this, it had zero truth. It was, of course it was untrue. And, for, and to put out, so Downing Street creates falsehoods, gives, gives them on a sort of, pre, pre, uh, gives them to uh, the newspaper journalists to then report it. And it's all unaccountable because it's Downing Street sources. And so, and it's so much not what journalists should do. As I come back to it, it's not a, it's not a grand thing being a journalist. It's a, our job is to try and tell the truth about power and not to become instruments of power. And that unfortunately, tragically, is what has happened to to many of my former colleagues in the in the printed and broadcasting press that they are simply happy to be instruments of political power. 
just on Dominic, let's talk about Dominic Cummings, uh, who obviously plays a key role in your block. But also, I mean, is part of the issue, if we look about vote leave and you look at the the impact of vote leave, the kind of takeover of the Conservative Party by the vote leave sect, I suppose, is the issue that you know this is a parliamentary democracy in which parliament is supposed to reign supreme? And, you know, Clement Attlee and others long had a critique of referenda that these were anathema to British democracy and they were the, the tools. And Maggie Thatcher too, by the way. Sorry? I, and Maggie Thatcher too. And, Margie, and Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> uh, but that they were seen as tools of demagogues and dictators. And what a referendum does is, you know, in, in, inevitably it's it's a unique device in a democracy to link up, to, to whip up a certain type of populist fervor because you then get a result uh, which can be interpreted arguably in in various different ways what leaving the European Union can mean a range of different relationships with the European Union which then have to be debated and discussed but you can always claim the will of the people is this that or the other and that then overrides so even though a year later the British people voted for a hung parliament in which there was a majority for a soft Brexit. The referendum was actually about making parliament sovereign, supposedly. And yet that parliament was demonized as overriding the will of the people, even though it was the will of the people. That was the whole point of that, of, of how parliament works. But that's what that that's what that's what that referendum does. It it creates this sort of a uh, a type of populism. I don't think populism always has to be used as pejorative, but people disagree on that. Um, in which it's not about truth or honesty so much, but about popular fervour and emotion. Yeah, I, that is, of course that's true of elections too. I know you, there's an element, you know, of course you've got to whip up enthusiasm, but what what, what won that referendum was vote leave, and they had used uh, almost barbarously cynical methods during the. Uh, referendum campaign and um, Johnson brought that vote leave machinery with him into number 10 Downing Street um, and not just Dominic Cummings but a, a group of others and then employed that methodology once he got in there which is what made it his his treatment of the press and his his lies so so um, well, basically, that is what he—that's how he operated as prime minister, and, I, and that has poisoned our politics. And it is—it is in risk of destroying our country because democratic institutions cannot exist through lies. Um, one of, for instance, I, I keep these records. Um, the number of misleading and false statements on the floor of the House of Commons, which according to the British Constitution, the Ministerial Code, or Erskine May, the procedural guide to Parliament, that, 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 that should not be possible. You should, a minister who makes a misleading or false statement on the floor of the House of Commons should come back and correct you. And that can be perfectly honourable if you make a mistake, as we all do in the height of the moment or you get your facts inadvertently wrong, you come back and correct it, and that's fine. But these, these misleading and false statements remain on, on the record. I've got a list of them. I mean, I've got a list of them, which I'm sending uh, today or tomorrow to the Speaker of the House of Commons, because I think he ought to be, he just allows it. But as Speaker of the House of Commons, you shouldn't allow this sort of, that's your job, is to keep the place in good order. It's uh, and yet Johnson and his ministers again and again are making false statements on the floor of the House of Commons. Just a couple of other things. I mean, Dominic Cummings himself. Uh, I mean, you, you you obviously, as I say, write about Cummings in in detail that he despised the Conservative Party and hated British institutions. I mean, I, he's never been a member, as far as I know, or well, he isn't now a member of the Conservative Party. I mean, just somewhat. What, what do you think his philosophy is? Because it often comes across as slightly nihilistic. But, but also, I mean, how is this takeover differently? Because in in the sense that the conserv this is not new in the Conservative Party history. I mean, Thatcherism at the time, the Thatcherite juggernaut was seen as, and you know, it ostensibly pushed it, it, promoted, it presented itself as being against the Conservative old guard, uh, the so called who were presented as the Wets. Uh, she called herself a Gladstonian liberal. Uh, and had a kind of revolutionary zeal about her, which 
was relatively new in that in that in 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 modern conservative politics. Is it that different from that? And how is it? Yeah, I will explain. Uh, I think there's the left. The left hasn't made this easy to understand because she was so electorally po popular uh, that the, that I think that she was demonised. Um, Thatcher uh, was actually a much more conventional politician than than, than you than, than a lot of people have acknowledged. Um, and she she above all in 1974 when she became. Uh, Tory leader. It was still a mass political party. There were well over a million, maybe I'm, I'm estimating one or the, but probably two two million uh, Tory members. Um, and uh, she she certainly came from the right of the party, as Tory, Tory leaders tend to do. But uh, she came, she 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 became leader of the Tories through traditional means. Now you don't know, fast forward from Thatcher to the. Tory party which elected uh, Johnson in in 2019 now by then the membership has collapsed it's maybe a hundred thousand just over um, and, and what that means is that it's the, the, all those subscri tiny subscriptions you know of a one million two million three million as it was after World War two people you know aren't there uh, and the Conservative Party was captured by instead by large donors um many of whom we don't really know much about um and these large donors are in there for reasons which are sometimes perfectly innocent they want to be given peerages well i don't mind too much about that actually uh for some reason some just sort of commercial they want to be rewarded with contracts that's that's corruption and uh it's happening you, you, you one surmises there's the circumstantial evidence that that is happening on a large scale at the moment and the third one is is ideological they they, they want to buy policy and create policy and, and essentially the tory party has become a manifestation of its rich owners uh, um uh, in the last it, it, this is a trend which was well underway before johnson uh, it was a very kind of profound change, unnoticed as far as I know by my by, by political journalists. A very profound change. I think it came in under under Cameron. The, the office of co-chairman of the Tory Party was invited invented. Now, the chairman under the Thatcher era, which you're so dismissive of, was actually rather an exp a Peter Fornacroft or Willie Whitelaw, normally from the left, normally very good at going out there and and navigating its way through the party membership. Suddenly, the chairman becomes a very insignificant figure, like uh, Amanda Milling, I think she's called at the moment, but she doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, the significant person is the treasurer, because the treasurer reports back to the donors and delivers the money. And they, of course, only deliver money. And these donors, if they like the policies, and those donors have created policy and they have big, big ambitions and so really only a very small number of very large men very rich men i think largely now this is some again the mainstream media ignores this issue but there are open democracy peter the man whose name i can't pronounce i apologize saying peter georgen something like that i can and, never pronounce him i'm glad you said that <laughs> yes. anyway peter g at open democracy has been doing some very good work uh, i've noticed on this subject before I ask my final question, there was another another question about the media I forgot to ask, which was, it's about the revolving door. Um, and this is particularly the case, actually, with the BBC. So Boris Johnson, as mayor of London, recruited Gitta Harry from the BBC. David Cameron, of course, Craig Oliver from the BBC. George Osborne, Thea Rogers, senior producer from the BBC. Uh, and again, uh, oh, sorry, who, how can I forget? Theresa May, Robbie Gibb, head of BBC Westminster uh, programming. Allegra Stratton, who went from BBC to ITV, uh, and is now the spokesperson for Boris Johnson. It's not. It's not massively healthy, is it? Objectively, in a and I, I know you don't look. You don't choose your partner, but it is slightly embarrassing to say the least that her husband is a flagship Times and Spectator columnist who's opining on the media on on the government for which his wife is the official spokesperson. That revolving door. What does that? What? What does that tell us about where our democracy is is headed? Yeah. Well. 
I mean, it hasn't just started. You might, it's, it is worth, in, the, in fairness, reminding everybody that uh, Gavin Davies became chairman of the BBC under, I think, Tony Blair in the early years of this century, uh, who was a Labour donor and, um, uh, and actually a Goldman Sachs banker. <laughs> it's a very, very good combination, Labour donor straight. Goldman Sachs banker, if you, and, and so that that part that uh, those revolving doors, um, what they, uh, but I do agree. What it shows you is that that is, it's much too incestuous. The media and politicians um, have become too alike. And in, in fact, if you look at the senior level of this government, um, it is very significant that the, both the Prime Minister and probably his most important Lieutenant Michael Gove are both extremely successful journalists destined to be editors and major figures in the media who went into politics. This is, all those examples you've just quoted, and there are plenty of others, that they, they show you that this is essentially a government of right-wing journalists for right-wing journalists. It's a very narrow uh, talent base and what you're seeing is that uh, people from serious walks of life uh, beyond this tiny narrow incestuous world um, are, are no longer part of it and it is, it's a sickness by the way it's a real dark not dark so much as we've got to bring back real people into politics Finally, look, this is a brilliant book. It's compelling. The evidence is absolutely incontrovertible. The By case the way, the of evidence is a tiny amount. I didn't have room to present get, present more than a tiny amount of the lies and falsehoods. Do, do mean, some I, more before we finish. Do some more. Go on. Go for it. No, no, I meant I mean they're just I I, I can't. Oh, I see in the book. I thought you meant today. Book. No, yeah. In the book, I couldn't provide more than a, a tiny, relatively small fraction. Of all. Which, ma which which makes it more disturbing because this book has is, is packed full of not your lies the lies of others, it is uh, jam packed full of, of of obvious objective lies. But this is what I'll put to you, and it's, it's a final question linked together. This is in a normal functioning democracy would be a scandalous book that no prime minister would have recovered from. Anyone reading it would go, we are run by a self-evident con man, a charlatan, a serial liar. Nothing he says can ever be trusted. I put it to you that this brilliant, eloquent book will not touch him. What does that tell us? Why, why is this man so impossible to, to, uh, to, to pin down? Well, you have pinned him down. Why is he so impossible to, uh, to you, know, you know, indestructible despite this devastating case against him and finally how does the story of boris johnson end because i could see mass vaccination people will forget the bigger one of the biggest theft tolls in the earth a catastrophic handling of the pandemic labor may not offer an inspiring vision and 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 people he will be seen you know he loves sunshine and optimism that's what he does how does the story end and why isn't your book going to destroy him well i didn't Actually, I didn't write the book to destroy Mr. Johnson. But what I did was in order to draw attention to the, to try and tell the truth about the methods used by Downing Street and its allies in the press to create a false vision of the world. Now, at some stage, sooner or later, nobody knows when, these the, 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 this will go wrong. Um, I think it shows... What does it tell us about us? It tells us that we have become quite feeble. We we no longer value things which matter. If you believe that truth and honesty is important, as I do, and I think most people do, then you must believe there's something awful at the heart of this government. And a society which tries to, to, to base itself on deceit and falsehood and rewards it is a society which is in real, not just moral danger, but actual danger. Pia, as I say, an absolutely devastatingly uh, eloquent uh, expose of our Prime Minister, which anyone who cares, regardless of where you're on the political spectrum, anyone who cares about democracy uh, in this country, and democracy is a principle in general, a functioning democracy, not a, ge not a democracy in, in, in terms of you know, with all the trappings of democracy, but a genuine democracy in which truth is obviously a critical 
part because without truth in a democracy, we're no longer uh, we're no longer I think able to honestly describe us as such. So thank you so so much. This is a book everyone really does need to read. It, it is devastating, and we will see how how your updated book. Fine, I would love to read the book, which you will write when Boris Johnson finally meets uh, Hebrews meets Nemesis. But thank you, Peter. Well, thank you very much. We're never going to succeed in radicalizing politics and doing what must be done on behalf of the many if we do not challenge the dominance of the establishment media uh, with our own media. So support Owen Jones' team on Patreon.